everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, perform uh, a colloquium series. I'm happy to introduce today uh, uh, Dr. Christoph Rover. Uh, I know that you know very well Christoph, uh, but just to say that Christoph is a uh, professor in the Department of Physics at Concordia University and a member of the Perform Center. And he is going to talk today about studying the brain activity through multimodal neuroimaging technique. Well, please not. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Abid, for the introduction. Uh, so we will be starting. Uh, we have a few people in the room here, and we have a, a camera that is following us. So that's why the video is a bit original, I would say, for this time. So happy to see you all here and uh, looking for your feedback. So the purpose today is to show you mainly what uh, we can do with the so-called um, so uh, physiology platform, and uh, which is the new plat uh, platform at Perform Center. And among the different tools we have on that platform, I will be focusing mainly on two aspects. So the first aspect is uh, EEG and simultaneous EEG fMRI. And the second aspect is uh, functional uh, near infrared spectroscopy. So that's gonna be uh, the different tools that we do have right now at the phone. Just to give you a quick idea, we do have high density EEG that can fit inside the MR. And this is, for instance, during a visual task. So here you see the. Video. OK, starting. So you see the digitalization of the 256 point on the head model over there. And then during the this was our first test that performed. So we were doing a visual task in EEG and fMRI at the same time. And we will be showing you what kind of EEG reconstruction we got uh, at the same time as fMRI for that task, just in a minute. So that's the kind of visual reconstruction. So that's EEG sources. And just to give you another idea, so the other uh, family of technique we are using is called functional knee infrared spectroscopy. So we're gonna send light to the brain to follow uh, to eliminate the brain and to follow hemodynamic response, like fMRI, but using wearable technology. Uh, so we're gonna put laser sources and detectors on the scalp to follow. And this is just a, an example that we did, a proof of uh, concept. So here you have two source over there and detectors or around here. And then we put an high density montage on top of it. So we have a locally dense uh, visual montage for NIRS high density EEG, and we did fMRI using the same visual task. And here, as an example, you see the EEG reconstruction in milliseconds. You see the f -NIRS reconstruction showing a few seconds later an increase in oxyhemoglobin and a decrease in deoxyhemoglobin, and you see the fMRI standard map, all three at the same place uh, for this specific, specific experiment. So let's start uh, the first part of the talk. I'm gonna be talking about the kind of study we have done using EEG and fMRI, and what are the pitfalls and what we can do uh, here. And uh, okay. so, so first, uh, what is EEG? Very briefly, EEG is going to be using scalp electrodes to measure electrical neuronal activity. The good point: so it's a direct measurement as opposed to fNIRS and fMRI. You're measuring at a temporal resolution of one millisecond, so very rapidly. The good point is the time, the bad point is space. Now you're using scalp recording and we are just measuring. I'm sorry, I have to just remove I think I have my name. Here we go. We should not hear sound. So, uh, it's scalp recording, so only uh, we detect difference of electrical potential on the scalp. And I'm going to show you that we can do better than that because we can inverse the problem to get quite accurate source reconstruction from scalp recording. Perhaps not from only 20 electrodes, but when you are using 40, 60, and so on, we can do uh, an accurate job. 
So few examples of EEG with standard clinical 19 electrodes or 256 electrodes. That would be some background EEG signal. And between two lines here, you have one signal. So it's very rich in terms of temporal content for EEG. And in terms of source reconstruction, I just want to mention, because I'm going to mention this one in the nearest concept as well, some work I've done since a long time with my main collaborator, Jean-Marc Lina, on a technique called maximum entropy on the mean, which is particularly accurate uh, to reconstruct in 3D brain activity from scalp recording. And we're going to use it for EEG and MEG, and then for niche. So the good point about MEM is that it's sensitive to the special extent of the underlying generator. And that's what we're going to show. And we can use also a wavelet version to localize oscillations. This is just an illustration where we have an epileptic discharge. It's going to be my main illustration about epilepsy, shown in EEG here. This is work I'm doing at McGill on MEG. We don't have MEG here at the phone, but we have everything else. And these are standard reconstruction with a famous technique called minimum norm uh, estimation. And this is what MEM will show you. And we are showing that we were quite accurate. So that's for source imaging. Now, fMRI, very briefly, you all familiar with fMRI. You put someone in the scanner, and we're going to look for the fluctuations of the variation in deoxyhemoglobin and blood flow at the time of the uh, of the activity. So you define a paradigm on off, typically a block paradigm, you apply an image of full volume every three seconds. And then if I look at the signal for that voxels, the signal, if there is activity there, the signal should follow my paradigm, convolved by the hemodynamic response. So it will occur quite suddenly. Going fast on that. So just an important aspect, which is going to be the same for uh, fMRI and fNIRS is that the hemodynamic response is really picking five seconds after the neuronal activity. So it's quite late and slow response. That we do. So why do we want to combine EEG and fMRI? If you don't need to, I would say do not, because you're going to increase your problem if you do uh, simultaneous EEG and fMRI. But in some cases, we want to have EEG in the scanner to make some specific measurements. So typically, we want to use the information from the EEG to analyze the fMRI signal. And two particular examples, that's what we've been doing with Dr. Jean Gottman at McGill on epilepsy. So you record epileptic activity, spontaneous epileptic activity from EEG, and you use that to analyze the fMRI signal. And another similar pattern that we did here is to study sleep and notably sleep patterns, sleep discharge, like spindles and slow wave. And I'll show you an example. That's what we have done here. We can also study uh, the impact of the EEG background on the fMRI ball signal. So our fluctuation in the alpha band are related to changes in the hemodynamic signals, or our changes in connectivity of the EEG part have uh, correspondence on the fMRI part. And of course, for specific studies in neuroscience or in cognition, you might want to do the same task exactly at the same time, like to monitor, for instance, the level of attention or some level of memory of learning aspect that if you just redo the task twice, you will not get the same result. So concretely speaking, this is how an EEG fMRI setup looks like. So you put your subject in the scanner, you want to make sure your electrodes are not moving so that's why we use sand baths and uh, a specific pillow to avoid the motion and the vibration. Because as you know, the MR is probably the worst environment where you want to record an EEG. Uh, if you have motion of an electric cable inside of magnet, it's going to generate a huge current, quite larger than the EEG signal. So that's one problem of the EEG, of the, the EEG inside the scanner. The other problem is that the magnetic field is changing because during an fMRI sequence, we are changing gradient. So if the magnetic field is changing, it's going to create current inside the electrodes. And that's the kind of huge artifact that we have that we need to correct before doing something. What are the source of artifacts we have? And recording an EEG in the MR room is quite challenging. 
So the main source of artifact are, of course, every movement, every slow, small movement of electrical equipment will generate a huge signal, if not a saturation. And of course, we have, as I just said, the change of the magnetic field will generate current. So the gradient, uh, when we scan the change of the gradient of magnetic field will generate a current as well. And sometimes we want to remove the helium pump because it's gonna also create more high frequency artifact. And finally, what we call the ballistocardiogram. And the ballistocardiogram is an artifact, as you can see here, that occurs, that is very large for your EEG inside your MR, that occurs after every heartbeat. The main reason for that is probably at every heartbeat, your head is moving a little bit and this small motion is creating huge artifact. Now, even if you don't believe you're moving, you actually are moving a little bit at every time beat, at every heartbeat. And we have different solutions that exist to correct for that. So this is how we look an MRI when you start scanning with gradient artifact. That's what you look, uh, not the MRI, but the EEG. So of course you don't see any EEG signal over there. It's full of artifact. What the specific amplifier we have that are MR compatible have a huge dynamic not to saturate the signal because the signal is going to be very huge and very high sampling rate to correct after accurately this artifact that is quite fast. So we are sampling at five kilohertz, which is way above the signal of interest of EEG, which is around 100 hertz maximum. So then what we can do is correct for this gradient artifact because the good news for us is the, the gradient artifact is created by the machine. So it is highly reproducible actually. So we can model it, average it and have a specific pattern of this artifact and then we remove it. And that's the first way to clean our EEG signal. And when we do that, we get a signal like that, which is not bad, but when you look more closely, here you have the EKG, so the, the electrocardiogram, which is quite bad quality, but here you have every heartbeat. And you see that few hundred milliseconds after every heartbeat, you see a little blood like that, a little artifact. And that's what I was saying. This is typically the ballistocardiogram artifact, like after every heartbeat, small motion of the head, generating an artifact in your data. So we want to further correct for that. So one of the standard technique is also uh, average uh, and, uh, and subtraction. So similarly to what we did for the gradient artifact, we can assume that the heartbeat artifact is reproducible. So we take several of them, we average, we create a pattern and we remove it. There are other techniques. Some people have used ICA. Some people have used some specific basis functions to, to remove that. And so so this would be a signal after what we call ballistocardiogram correction, which is okay, not perfect, but this is the signal where we start from. Modeling the EKG inside the, inside the scanner is very difficult. It is highly variable. I give you a few examples of how an EKG could look like in the scanner, and it can be relatively clean from relatively terrible signal here. And the problem when you use just the average uh, methods to, to remove this effect is that, of course, your heartbeat and the response to your heartbeat is varying, and that's not taken into account with the standard. But that's where most people will do, and we can still do good thing. And this is a, an old study I did with my colleague Louis Tibert, who's in Nancy now, and this was done in the lab of Jean Gottman. And here we are showing you what is the bold response that is answering to the responding to the fluctuation in the alphabet. So basically, we were filtering in the alpha band, involving with an hemodynamic response function. And you see that when you have increase in the alpha band, you do have increased bold activity uh, in the thalamus, and it's, uh, it's negatively correlated. So it's decreased in the alpha band, it's increased here, and negatively correlated with the occipital region, which is quite a typical signal. Of course, when you do EEG only, you retrieve this occipital region, that it's going to be very difficult to retrieve these deep thalamic uh, regions. This is just uh, rapidly a study where we apply that in epilepsy with uh, my fellow Dr. Shiko Abdallah, and we nicely compared 
EEG MEG source imaging, EEG fMRI with the gold standard in epilepsy, which is intracranial imaging. So in a nutshell here, you have an epileptic spike. This is MEG EEG source imaging. This is fMRI response. And this is a seizure and a spike in intracranial imaging. So this is a model of the different electrodes that were in the brain. And this is where this, the seizure or the epileptic spike are generated from the intracranial data. And then from the source imaging on EEG or from the fMRI, we are projecting it on the same data. So we can actually compare those in the same space. And when we do that, I'm just gonna skip here, we found that the, the best spatial overlap you have between your EEG source localization and the truth, the intracranial EEG, the, the closest you are to the distance to the generator. And the same for the seizure onset zone. So EEG MEG were more localizing the primary irritative zone. So where we have um, the primary irritative zone is where the spike are generated. And if you're right, it was actually more localizing the seizure onset zone where you have more oxygen consumption. So it's not exactly the same region. It's very close, but not exactly the same. And that was a nice and elegant study to do that using the only gold standard we can have intracranial EEG, so direct measurements on EEG in situ. Let's go to perform now. So that's, I'm gonna summarize what we did for our first study using simultaneous high density EEG fMRI at perform. So kind of the same study, uh, the correction technique I just introduced you. And the first questions that Tangi and Umit raised is, can we do good EEG source imaging from acquisition from bad quality EEG acquired in the scan. So what we did, again, we chose our preferred uh, visual task, visual paradigm. So just half, uh, half, half view uh, visual checkerboard, as you see here. And then we acquired, uh, we acquired the data either inside or outside the scan. So we had several trials. So we did different level of averaging by taking different of our, of our trials we get an evoked response. And then from that evoked response, either we look properties from the scalp, like signal to noise ratio correlation uh, with what we expect to see. And we did source reconstruction and we compare source reconstruction where we expected the activity to be and with it. And we use two main techniques, our own uh, maximum entropy on the mean technique and the standard minimum norm estimate. And in that context, here you have an example here where you have MEM reconstruction, and these are for check here. Yeah, so see, these are data outside the scanner, and these are data inside the scanner. So MEM was quite robust. Uh, MNE was a bit more spread, but the maximum was at a good place, and it was important with the MRI. And this is another example where outside of it was a little bit better outside and inside, but still okay. Here inside the scanner, MNE failed completely because it was attracted by some of the main artifacts. And this is what you get as a grand average over, I think it was 12 or 14 subjects. And you see that EEG inside and out, inside and outside the scanner, we get some pretty nice reconstruction, a bit better, a bit cleaner with MEM than MNE, but overall, we were able to do some level of good source reconstruction for an easy uh, signal, very good signal to noise ratio, which is a network response. Uh, localizing oscillatory pattern resting state could be way more challenging and we need to improve the signal. And that's what we did next, especially because uh, we defined with my collaborator here, Dr. Tan Deng Wu, we defined our first uh, EEG fMRI sleep study. And so we're gonna show how we improve the signal and what we extracted then from that fMRI signal. So to do that, what we did, it was a study to study the impact on sleep deprivation on cognitive, on cognitive performance. So this is the design. So we selected uh, 20 uh, healthy adults, 12 uh, female, and so, all of them had an habituation night, which was in the sleep lab here at Perform. And then randomly, either during the first night they were doing a normal night or they were doing 24 hours sleep deprivation. So all night sleep deprivation. 
action. So we had fellows that were maintaining in, maintaining in awake during the whole night. And so after the normal night, we put them in the scanner using high density EG and fMRI. And during the scanner, what we did is we did several tasks. So typical tasks to monitor memory and attentions like uh, LBAC task, attention network task, uh, psychomotor uh, vigilance task. And so we did that. And then seven days later, for instance, those who were having a normal night having a full night sleep deprivation or the other way around. And when it was full night sleep deprivations, first we were installing the EG, put them in the scanner, asked them to stay away while we were doing those set of tasks. Then we gave them the opportunity to sleep. So they were sleeping one hour, they were sleep deprived. So it's easy to get, of course, to sleep in those conditions. And they were sleeping in the scanner during one hour. We wake them up and we redo the task after them. And as expected, the main impact that we saw is that here you have the three tasks and you have the effect on accuracy and um, reaction time for the three tasks. And what's happening is actually when you are sleep deprived, your performance are decreasing a lot. But after one hour nap, you are improving. Not as good as if you do a normal night, but you are improving significantly. As you can see here, sleep deprived, the accuracy reduced in and back and go up. And this is the pattern we found for all okay. Then we wanted to analyze, of course, the EEG signal to study what's going on when they were sleeping on, on those data. So on a normal EEG data during sleep, these are the typical patterns you would like to see. And notably those sleep spindles that are highly linked to memory consolidations or slow waves. The problem is that we start with an EEG like that. And even after the corrections that, were, that we were showing, the, the, the sleep spindles were quite difficult to detect. And for instance, this would be an, uh, before, uh, after ballistocardiogram correction or with no ballistocardiogram correction, and if we, we had expert marking spindles, and if we do a, an average of those spindles and looking at the time frequency response, this is what the kind of response we get even after ballistocardiogram correction. So the spindle is probably here, but you see it's spreading over there and you have some low frequency components. So the correction is not perfect here. And this is with ballistic radiogram correction and without, so without it's even worse, you don't see the spindle at all. So Makoto Uji was a postdoc fellow working with me and, and Tandem Bu, uh, had this idea of using beamformer. Beamformer is known in the field of EEG as a source reconstruction technique, but more than that, it's a spatial filtering technique. So the idea, it comes from radar theory, is that if you put your beamformer at a specific point, it's going to try to focus on everything that goes there while removing the rest of the activity. That's the principle of beamformer. And so the idea is we were using that to remove the effect of the ballistocardiogram, which shows it's a very large uh, impact to improve spindle detections. And actually, it works. So this is now, I'm not showing you spindle, this is average time frequency representation for all electrodes for the EKG, for the, the ballistocardiogram uh, signal. So this is the shape of the ballistocardiogram when you don't have BCG correction. And this is the shape when you correct with the spinal metal. So it's okay, but you see the artifact is still there. And so this is, and, and then when you put a specific region of the brain here, you put a spatial filter. So you, the beamformer is a, combination, a linear combination of some sensor that's going to focus there. And you see that for this particular region here, which we call a virtual electrode, then the correction was way better than uh, with the standard technique. And that's what uh, Makoto published in Human Brain Mapping. And if you look at the spindle, so this is where we were with the spindle. And now with the ballistoca, with the beamformer technique, you see that our spindle is way more localized. We get less of those low frequency and a little bit less of the high frequency as well. And this was used to analyze the fMRI data. And when we combine the fMRI, we, we get a bit better result. To continue on that, I will not spend too much time on that. Uh, Nathan Cross, who's a postdoc fellow at the 
working with Stan and Drew, looked at the fMRI signal. So now we have a good EG signal. We mark the different sleep stage and we look at the fMRI signal and the connectivity pattern in this context. So to do that, what we did, checking the time. So uh, standard preprocessing, I'll, I'll pass on that. And the main idea is we'll show you what we're going to measure is a notion of integration and information within brain network. And to do that, we need quite long uh, resting state recording. So to, do, to have long enough recording, what we did is we concatenated the three tasks and we regressed out the effect of the two tasks just to look at the underlying connectivity patterns, not related to the task effect, but to what remains. And the basic, what we reproduce, which is something that has been shown in the literature. So this is the connectivity of connectome. So these are different brain regions and you see the correlations between those different brain regions. And this is when you are well rested or when you are sleep deprived. And when you are sleep deprived, you get an increased functional connectivity when compared to when you are well rested. Okay, so you have an increased functional connectivity when you are sleep deprived. And a little bit like when you are sleeping. And this is a, a study done by Abib Ben Ali and Melanie Boli a few years ago, where they use this notion uh, to measure information, using information theory technique to measure the information that is flowing within brain network, actually within a network or between different networks. And we use that technique to measure the information within and between. We will pass that, but in a nutshell, the math behind that are telling you to do that, you need the covariance matrix. And to have the covariance matrix on those patterns, you need sufficiently long handsome. And that's what Nathan redid that with the help of uh, some fellow in my lab and in the lab of uh, Abi Ben Ali, like Obay and uh, Patene. And so this is the covariance structure, and we have uh, we have this hierarchical structure of the brain. So we use typically uh, Yale network. Uh, so the difference in brain network into seven or seventeen network, and we looked at the repartition of information. And pass that. So the main result is here. What we found out is that the total integration, total in information within all brain networks is increasing when you are sleep deprived. Here, SD compared to well rested and after the recovery after the nap. And what is even more important is this ratio, which is the information within network versus the information between networks. And this information is showing you the level of how much the networks are getting segregated. And what we do see is when you are sleep deprived, you're getting more segregated and even more when you are sleeping. Okay, so your brain is acting as an interconnected network, but when you start sleeping or when you are sleep deprived, it's working out more isolated network, more segregated. And what was interesting here is that we found a link between those patterns and how much you were uh, losing your cognitive performance in sleep deprived compared to well rested. And it was bidirectional. So it was also showing how much this increase of segregation and decrease of segregation after the nap was getting back to normal. So you were increasing your performance a bit. So to conclude on that, we have an increase in cortex wide functional integration which is driven by a rise of integration within cortical networks. And we also have an increase in functional cl uh, clustering ratio. And it suggests that sleep deprives, uh, drive the cortex towards a sleep-like state. So when we are in sleep deprived, we're not far from the same state when we are sleeping, actually. We are segregated, not integrated. And change in this level of segregation is linked to the deficits we'll have in terms of cognition. And it looks like it is a better marker of cognitive impairment than conventional markers like sleep pressure, for instance. And it is bidirectional because we saw the decrease during sleep deprivation and increase after uh, recovery and finish on it. So that ends my first part. I will now talk about what we can do uh, with NIRS, I'm checking for the time. Okay, so I'm going to probably do around 20 minutes on NIRS now. So what is FNIRS? 
we are shining light on the brain. So these are other techniques complementary to fMRI that we have actually uh, downstairs in the physiology classroom. So in a way, fNIRS is, you can name it a little bit like a portable or wearable fMRI if you want, which would be mainly cortical. And fNIRS is using light to measure non-invisibly the fluctuation of both oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin in the brain, in the muscle, with high temporal resolution. Now you are measuring light, so you can sample quite rapidly compared to fMRI, where we get one value, let's say every two seconds. So the principle is that way. You shine light on the brain, so you put a source of laser, a laser source or LED, once it's like when you put a laser pointer on your finger, the light will scatter in every direction. And so if you put a detector around there, the detector will get some back scattered light. And the light will, so the light propagates everywhere, changing direction all the time. And we're not like X-ray when we are crossing straight. Here we are scattering all the time. So every millimeter light is changing direction. And then if we put a, a detector three centimeter away from our source, then we can, some of our photons are gonna be lost and some of our photons will follow this banana shape and will cross roughly one centimeter of cortex. So by a source of pair and detectors, we can monitor what's going on there. And then the idea, so this light path is called a banana shape. And the idea is we can follow what's going on there because if I have changed, in brain activity there, I'm gonna have change in hemoglobin content and this change in hemoglobin content, I'm gonna change the absorption of the light. And why do we have that? Is because if you look the absorption spectra of different uh, components here, you see that the oxy and the deoxy hemoglobin here, uh, first there is almost no absorption by water within this near infrared uh, optical window. And then the two spectra, oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin, are crossing each other. So we can choose one wavelength being more absorbed by oxyhemoglobin and the other more absorbed by deoxyhemoglobin. So by measuring, by having for every point two laser source at two wavelengths, we can actually transform our measure of light intensity into change in oxy and deoxyhemoglobin content. So this is modified beyond the low. This was probably one of our very first tests. This is a view from the top. You have the different source in red, uh, detectors in green uh, that were installed on the cap during a finger tapping task. And we did fMRI. This is the fMRI map. And here you see the result projected in years, which with an increase in oxyhemoglobin and a decrease in deoxyhemoglobin. As expected, the decrease in deoxyhemoglobin is associated to the fMRI bone increase. And what is very new, because especially it's not very nice here, it's, it's, it's just a projection, but what's very new is the accuracy of the temporal response you see in oxy, deoxyhemoglobin, and total hemoglobin for the contralateral side and for the ipsilateral side, showing a positive response contralateral and a negative response ipsilateral. So what are the problems with NIRS? Also, we've been, uh, we just came back for ethnos conference in Boston and there are more and more systems that try to cover the whole brain. Most of current systems are not, are quite limited in space. So what we developed in the lab and for the needs we had was to develop what we call a personalized optimal montage to target, to monitor specifically brain regions. And we, I'm gonna show you what we do. So installing NIRS, sensors on the head is something not very easy. It's getting better, but it's, it's something difficult. And it's difficult to maintain optodes for long periods. As I'll show you, we are interested in sleep and there are no current good solution to install and cap like that, as you can see, are not at all uh, compatible with sleep studies. And we want to, to integrate that with EG. So what do we know? We know from the physics that if I put a source there and a detector there, it's gonna reach that part of the cortex. So what we want to make sure is, are we illuminating the portion of the brain that we want to illuminate? And so we propose a method that's gonna find the best position of the source and detectors to make sure you are really illuminating your target brain regions. 
And uh, so this is a summary of what we do. So we set all position of the skin as possible placement of our sensor. If you use a cap, you can replace that by the possible position on your cap. And then if you define a specific target here, we do Monte Carlo modelization to try to see what is the propagation of light in the tissue for that particular subject. And then we can, we have an, an, an algorithm, which is a complex algorithm because it's an estimation in integral number. So it's a tool from IBM that we're using that we're gonna define the set of best source and detectors to reach that particular target. So this is the best source and detectors. We are using a neural navigations to identify them on the subject. And usually that's what I will show you for sleep study. We are just gluing them with a clinical adhesive like the one we use for EEG prolonged monitoring, Polodion, so that we have very nice recording during long section, long, uh, long period. So a few examples of, example of local high density montage we can generate. And so this is just an example of a study we did. So this is, we targeted the motor regions over there and we selected uh, three source and 15 detectors covering nicely that regions. So we make sure that at least 13 detectors were seen by each sources. And this is the this this is underlying. You see the sensitivity map, the light sensitivity map, like your FNIRS forward model, if you want. And this is how it looks when you glue on the head of the subject. It's a little bit intense. There are all the techniques to do that. But to do all night recording in epilepsy patients or to do sleep studies, that's clearly the best approach we found for the moment. And this is an example for the tapping response on that. So what can we do from that? What is interesting, and I go back to our experience in EEG and MEG, we know how to do some very accurate 3D reconstruction. So we developed some 3D reconstruction technique. Uh, we adapted them to this, and this is what we call diffuse optical tomography. So the idea is you get the scalp measurement of, change in ox of changes in absorption in two wavelengths, and we transform that as changes in oxy and deoxyhemoglobin along the cortical surface. So very briefly, you have scalp recording, you have your forward model, so how much a change somewhere in the brain will impact your measures. And to do that, we are using the tool of Dr. Fang MCX lab, which is using Monte Carlo simulation. So we have a forward model that is personalized for every participant. And then the output is 3D reconstruction of local change in oxy and deoxyhemoglobin along the cortical surface. We can use standard technique, typically minimum norm, or our maximum entropy on the mean. And that's what, uh, so we are using this technique we developed for EEG and MEG. And that's what Zheng Shen Kai developed. So first he did a simulation. So this is uh, another montage we did. He did simulation. So what he did, he put generator at different point here. He added a, a, a box car. So he added a, a known hemodynamic response on which we added real noise, real data at different signal to noise ratio. And this is the kind of, so the truth is in black. And this is the result of the source reconstruction using MEN or MME for different patterns. We then did the same, but this time on real subject that we're doing finger tapping. And we did the comparison. And this is an example of one subject. You have fMRI, oxy deoxyhemoglobin from MEM, and the same for minimum norm. So as we know, the method is working the same way as it's working for EEG or MEG. MEM is a little bit cleaner, I would say. The maximum is well localized by all the techniques, but in terms of spatial extent, we are a bit uh, clean. Okay. So I pass this. So we have what we have here, and I, I'll just finish. I have a few examples to show you at the end of what you can do with those techniques. So this is an example of 10 subjects on which you have fMRI, oxy and deoxy response and mini, with MEM and minimum norm and the corresponding time course that we reconstruct. So the time cost is way more accurate than fMRI. And you see that locally, especially, we were almost at the same accuracy as fMRI. And what Zheng Shen did, they used the same study to, so now 
I will introduce all the tools we have downstairs and how we benefit from performance environment. We have a TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation downstairs. So we set up an experiment to do NIRS and TMS at the same time. You can do it in the, in the fMRI, it's way more complex for people that are doing fMRI session, TMS session, and then fMRI session separately. Here we do all together. So we did finger tapping before, single pulse TMS. So this means when you apply the pulse, you measure the muscle response to see how much excitability you have. And then we have the half an hour training that we're changing after putting more excitation or inhibition in the brain. So it's a specific technique that is combining electrical medium nerves and TNS or pass by. And then we do the single pulse and tapping at the end. So this is, for instance, what you measure with magnetic evoked potential. So this is when you increase the excitability, you see that your muscle, muscle response to a magnetic pulse here is gonna increase and that suggests more excitability. And this is what we got in years. So after the training, after increasing excitability for our tapping, we have a larger uh, response. So more oxyhemoglobin and less, so more negatively, the oxyhemoglobin as you can see here. And we show it was correlated and we just published, it came out yesterday, a nice Bayesian approach to that where we look at this, these connections more accurately, showing that the relationship between the evoked response by TMS and the hemodynamic response was occurring mainly between 10 to 15 seconds up along the hemodynamic response. So a few more examples to see. We, are, we wanted to study sleep, and I'll pass the detail, but studying sleep with EG fMRI, I showed you it's quite difficult. Usually you get two hours, three hours, very rarely. We know one group we did all night, so we wanted to have all night recording. So we're gonna use NIRS to do that. So uh, EEG, NIRS, and sleep for the, in the literature so far, it's been mainly done with two sensors on the front, and that's it. And so what we wanted to do is to adapt this to cover more extensively different parts of the cortex and notably different parts of the brain networks. So this is our setup. So this is our, I think this was an auditory system. So we were probing auditory regions bilaterally, glue the octodes uh, on both sides, and then we move the participants to the sleep lab. We move the nearest equipment. So now we are recording with the nearest equipment, with the sensors in place directly uh, in the sleep lab. And you get excellent recording onto that. And these are preliminary results of the power spectrum you see from the different signals either in the auditory regions or in the frontoparietal regions. And the typical patterns you can see here is that here you have the awake in red, and then the deeper you go in sleep, like N2, N3, you see that you get less of the very low, very slow fluctuations. We are at 0 0.01, at 0 0.005, it's very slow. And we, we see also change around 0.1 Earth and above, so mainly around the respiration reason. And what was interesting as well is when you go in REM sleep, as you know in EEG, when you go in REM sleep, you're getting closer to the EEG you have awake. And similarly for NIRS, the power spectrum of NIRS during REM sleep was closer to what we have awake. So, so again, more very slow fluctuations. And our objective here with uh, the PhD of Shala here is to, uh, to create an atlas of uh, physiological sleep using engineers with this technique. And then we have Edouard and Shifao who use the same technique now to study the interactions between epileptic activity and sleep. And here you see an epileptic, so here we are covering uh, the epileptic focus and the contralateral area. And we look for the hemodynamic response for epileptic discharge, transient epileptic discharge in different sleep stage. And I think that's the very first time you're showing that this response is changing with the sleep stage. And you see that we see a negative response and the negative response was more intense in N2 sleep compared to N3 or N1. And it was positive in N1. We got a seizure here. And these are just few other examples of some negative response that limp seems to be more sustained during deep sleep. So our 
hypothesis there is, can we imagine or can we assess that Perhaps the brain during those transient discharge that last 200 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds will generate local hypoxic effect. And that's what we would like to investigate using this interaction. And I have three more slides to go just to show you a few other examples we have. Uh, we have the visit of Julia Rocco right now in the lab, and they were doing some nice experiment today. So Julia has a big challenge. We want she wants to to study the cerebellum activity from NIRS and using optimal montage here to really catch the to really catch the cerebellum. It looks like we have response. And today here in the room, we have some uh, guests from Nyrix company and they've been doing their very first FNIRS fMRI experiment to try to catch the cerebellum. And uh, some tasks you are probably very familiar with uh, perform. We have many people who are studying aging and the notion of dual task during aging. So what's going on when I'm doing a cognitive task while walking? So with, uh, with currently, we set up this kind of experiment to cover bi uh, uh, bilateral frontal cortex. So doing uh, an arithmetic task, first uh, measurements we have and here we're really integrating a lot of sensors here so as you can see we have personalized FNIRS the way I was showing it we are measuring electromyogram wireless so muscle activity we are measuring foot switches to have gait characteristic and we are monitor we have an accelerometer to monitor motions and all that and we would like to move even further to be even more realistic and that's a project we are starting now is Karen Marta kirsten Orter and Abid Ben Ali is to do this kind of development, but now with some virtuality, uh, virtual reality setup. And this is our very first test of an end back task using virtual reality. Still quite simplistic, but here, you know, in end back, you should remember bike and you press the button if the next two, uh, the, the next object in two objects is going to be a bike. So something like that. So this is, it, it's very preliminary, of course, but that's where that's where we want to go next. We have a nice software package to handle all those data and near analysis. And I finished there by thanking everyone, especially all the fellows that have been involved here and uh, some of my collaborators. Not all are there, it's mainly uh, associated to the project I've been showing. Thank you and I'm ready. So yeah. if anyone has any questions, uh, again, you can enter them in the chat or just raise your hand. Yeah, it's in uh, interactive mode. So if you can, if you have a question, you can just uh, uh, open your mic and your video and ask for, and ask your question. So could you do it? Anyone or in the audience as well? You have any? Yeah, you do. That was, that was really fantastic and really cool to see all the projects. Um, I have a lot of questions, but I'll just start with you. You need to do the first one. I'm interested in, in the functional connectivity that you've shown that it, it increases. Um, I believe it was, it was during sleep. And then I'm, I'm wondering if you look back at some of the data, the, the past data that you collected when the participants had a chance to nap for an hour and look at functional connectivity frequency during the task. Pre-mapping, post-mapping, yeah. and that, you think how that would translate? And what is you know increasing function Maybe you said it and I missed it. So, so that, that's what we we did actually. So the question I'm repeating in, in, in case the sound is not perfect. So the question is about functional connectivity during the task and in sleep in our sleep deprivation paper. And so that's what we did. So we tried, of course, the very first idea was to get real resting state functional connectivity after sleep deprivation. But you could imagine that if you have not slept during the whole night, staying awake during 10 minutes, boring resting state, watching at a cross yeah. is just impossible. So we did the scan. We did not analyze those data because participants were fighting uh, to, were just fighting not to fall asleep. 
So what uh, Nathan proposed was to give functional connectivity during the task and he regressed out the effect of the task. So he used the regressor of the task, removed the effect of the task. So now we have a measure of functional connectivity during the task in the different states, so after a good night, after sleep deprivation and after the nap. And of course, we can do connectivity during sleep as well. And what we see is we see increased connectivity in sleep deprivation. And we have other studies that we're looking at hubs as well, where we see even further increased connectivity uh, during sleep. But that increased connectivity is, it's not everywhere. Like what we see is what we call more segregation. So when you are awake, when you alert, your networks are really small words that are talking at long distance and they are very efficient. But when you start sleeping, they start to isolate themselves. They have more local information coming up and that's in agreement with what Abib found also with Melanie Boli and some data from Liège a few years ago. And so when you are sleeping, it's more segregated. So it's within network, more information and less between network function. And this kind of impact as well, the way you're gonna retrieve uh, your cognitive performance after the test. We, we have, have a question from Mathis Fleury. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Professor Gruva. Uh, actually, I've got like um, a more technical question regarding the uh, identity cap. Uh, I was wondering like, uh, what is the, uh, was it, what is the quality of this kind of EG cap during time? Like, is it decreasing over time or is it the impedance good enough to, yeah. Okay. Very, very good question. So for those who don't know, I, I went fast on that, but this system from EGI company, which is now Max Team EGI, like the kind of 256 is not using gel as uh, in regular uh, EG, like in, Usually, EG, we're using a, a gel or paste to maintain the contact. And we can do that even with collodion during one week recording with no problem uh, in clinical setup. What with the EGI system, it's small sponges. Uh, all the little stuff are small sponges. And then these uh, small sponges, of course, are going to dry with time. So in our setup, we managed to get quality for a maximum of three hours. But I think three hours was really the maximum. We would not be able to get all night recording. And to maintain the humidity in each sponges, we were wrapping the head with cellophane just to make to maintain. And it's very dry, so you want to maintain that. Okay, thank you. Uh, actually, it's, uh, wait, three hours for me, it's very, <laughs> it's very good. <laughs> Uh, especially for motor, yeah, motor uh, task. So yeah, thank you, thank you for your question. Okay. Thank you. Do we have other questions? Yeah, I have Chris. You can unmute. Show yourself. <laughs> Hello, Chris. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Good. So um, thanks very much. Really, really nice talk, and and lots and lots of stuff going on. It's really impressive to see. Um, I have a question about the fMRI EG, um, as you expect I might. Um, I think I was just wondering, so the the connectivity analysis that you did there, um, similar to the first speaker, what was the actual analysis? Was this just a Pearson's correlation? So uh, it's not my work, it's Nathan's work, but it did both actually. And you have, and you have even a third project on that. So the first thing that Nathan did was Pearson correlation. So standard person correlation. And then uh, the metric that were developed uh, by the team of Habib uh, that are using information theory. And uh, that this is you have a you, you have a hierarchical network structures and you use inform information theory a little bit like mutual information and so on to measure the information between and within network. So it's not Pearson correlation, but it's not uh, you get less. Um, and in Meng Wang and Kang Juli, we also developed some technique to, to estimate the hubs of functional connectivity. 
and we find out that the hubs are also changing uh, when you go uh, when you're in different sleep stage and that's related uh, to the um, that's also related to the way uh, it's going to impact the, um, the cognitive performance. Great. Okay. Thanks. Can, I, can I ask a, a small follow up? Yeah. Um, sure. Just a couple of detailed questions, maybe in comparison between the, I guess, the fMRI, the EG, and the F mirrors. Um, do you have some comments on the effective spatial resolution that you can get with these three different techniques and potential differences in like sulcal versus gyro biases in the signals? Yeah, it's a very good question. We could spend one hour on that. There are different aspects. For, for clear, fMRI will show probably the better, the best spatial resolution among all these techniques because it's a direct measurement. All the others, it's after reconstruction that you get the space. We are getting there. We are more and more accurate. But the other good point with fMRI is that it's really the only technique where you will be able to monitor accurately uh, deep structure, hippocampus, uh, uh, subcortical structure like thalamus, like these are very challenging uh, for EEG, perhaps possible, uh, I would say probably not possible at all with FNIRS from what I've seen. And FNIRS, it's really the top of the gyri that you'll see and a little bit inside, like one centimeter, one centimeter and a half of cortex. And there are new system also using time resolve FNIRS that try to go a little bit deeper. That's what's going on in the FNIRS community right now, but it's mainly the, the top of the gyri, I would say. And uh, EEG is, uh, you, you can go up to the depths of the gyri, but way more difficult to go into the, like, into the thalamus of the particular structure. Yeah, uh, I have another question here from, uh, we have a question from Augusto. Hi, from hello. Augusto. Hello, thanks for the talk. Um, just a, a few, uh, a curiosity that I have on the experiment that you conducted with TMS before and after session. Um, if I understood well that that probe was placed basically on, uh, on the motor areas, mostly. Yeah. It's not covering other areas. Do you plan to do other uh, analysis or experiments with other tasks over that? Fiber, the same one before and after. And, and, the, and the, the, uh, the TMS probe is just, during the old, old experiment, it stayed there. We, we really blocked the head of the subject and we stayed there. So the yeah. TMS probe is always there. Of course, we make sure by doing just the single pulse that you still get the stimulation on your, on your muscle. Yeah, yeah because my curiosity is, is just that even for a, for a simple task like finger tapping, just to see like a difference like that so big in the, in terms of amplitude would be also cool to see it uh, if uh, it's repeated also in other areas would be very, very interesting. So I was just curious if you're planning to do something, uh, something else over that. Uh, not for the moment. I'm missing the people. <laughs> oh, okay. to do it. If you want to come to do it, that's an idea. <laughs> but uh, because the main person who did that, Zheng Shen, is now a postdoc at McGill. Uh, but we do have, and we are still exploiting this data. And notably, there's something, one thing in the data sets that we have that is really unique that we have not tested because now we still compare uh, post and pre, but we do record the FNIRS during the whole protocol. So the main idea is to, to try to, to, to assess dynamically when learning the plasticity is changing, like during the protocol. And that's feasible. It's a bit more technical, like because the pulse are more uh, are closer. So this requires, for the technical word, it's it requires decomposition technique. But we we want to we want to go there in some of the next step on this data set. Okay, thank you. Very interesting. Thank you so much. I think there was a question from Abib there. So if you speak, they will see you. <laughs> yeah, okay. Th thank you very much, uh, Christophe, for this uh, nice presentation and uh, really a uh, large scope of presentation with a lot of uh, research for that. So my, my question is uh, about when you uh, deal with EEG fMRI or with NIRS fMRI, 
uh, you uh, come with each modalities, you reconstruct the modalities, and then you compare. And this is more visual comparison or qualitative, I would say, comparison. So I'm just wondering about uh, some work that you know we did with uh, Jean Denisot. I don't know how much years, I'm, I'm old now. So ten, at least 10 years or 15 years ago. Uh, and when we develop a method to reconstruct the EEG fMRI both of it at the same time. And we look at the space where the two modalities are coherent and the space where the two modalities are incoherent, meaning coming with different information. So this gives like a new map where we see coherences between the reconstruction of the two modalities. So I think this is this kind of approach can be done uh, yeah. in a spatial temporal domain with EEG fMRI, exactly as you did, and uh, also uh, with NIFS yeah. uh, fMRI, because we, we never do that. So how uh, coherent are NIFS and, uh, and fMRI both? So what do you think so, about this? Yeah. The fusion is nice. I would say, like uh, for those or if some in the audience are interested, that's uh, a course I'm giving every year at McGill, which is called Biomedical Imaging Fusion, where we go in the detail of all those methods of, of fusion. And so, in in a way, what we do here is constrained fusion. So, how the EEG is informing the fMRI analysis, how the EEG is informing the FNIRS analysis, all comparatively. We did in the past, as you just said. Uh, uh, as you just said, Abib, we, what we did in the past was uh, the real fusion, so try to reconstruct both of them. It's actually feasible with most of those modalities. Uh, there are nice papers from Ted Hooper showing uh, reconstruction of fMRI and FNIRS at the same time. Of course, you need simultaneous recording, and that's uh, we did our first uh, yesterday. So hopefully we might, uh, we might check those aspects. Um, so this is of interest is for the question of neuroscience behind, usually those techniques are highly complicated and a little bit more difficult to adapt, but you are learning from them. So it's, uh, I did not uh, uh, stop uh, getting interested in that. So it's just that to, to answer our uh, clinical questions, we were going more towards more constraint or comparative technique. But yes, the fusion is something. And to really understand the details uh, of the change in the neurovascular coupling, I think that's something. And for instance, what we are doing uh, with Edouard on looking at the interaction between sleep and epilepsy. Uh, we have EEG and NIRS during all night. We have EEG and fMRI usually during the nap. So there's not separating. But we have the EEG in the middle. The EEG will tell us you are in the same sleep stage, and these are similar epileptic discharge. So this is actually a very nice framework to try fusion technique to benefit from fMRI and from FNIRS, try to assess and to model, and our goal is to model uh, oxygenation to see if we have hypoxia. So, so we, with Edouard Belair, we will try to do it. Anyone else? If you speak, the camera will go to you. <laughs> okay, do we have someone else in the audience? Are we all good? So I think it's time. So thank you very much. If you're interested in doing new research in the physiological suite here, please come to see us. We can show you what you have. We might set up a demo in the next future. And so we have lots of tools downstairs. We are getting more and more. And so we'd be happy to see what's the best for your proposed experience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.